Um, good afternoon. Welcome to uh, the Finance Committee public hearing on the Convention Center hotel expansion that has been proposed. I first want to thank my colleagues in attendance, Council Member Emmanuel Remy, Council Member Shayla Favor, and Council Member Rob Dorrance. Thank you for being here. The purpose of today's hearing is to review a proposed partnership between the City of Columbus, Franklin County, and the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority to expand uh, our downtown convention, and I'd also like to thank Council President Shannon Harden, um, our downtown convention hotel capacity. A previous agreement between the city, county, and CFA supported the financing of the current 532-room Hilton Hotel that is operated by the CFA in support of the Greater Columbus Convention Center. That hotel has been a success. Its performance has surpassed pro projections and its revenue has been enough to pay the debt service for its construction. No city or county support has been necessary to do that. Thanks in part to the success of the current Hilton, Columbus has attracted national and international conferences and sporting events and continues to be a desirable destination for these events. In order to attract additional and larger conferences and events, the CFA is proposing the construction of an expansion to the existing hotel. City Council authorized the execution of a memorandum of understanding last May that allowed the CFA to move forward with the planning and design of the project. We are here this afternoon to review the next step in this process, which is the authorization of a cooperative agreement. We expect to vote on the authorization of this agreement at the City Council meeting coming up this Monday, April 8th. During today's hearing, we will hear from uh, Brian Ross, President and CEO of Experience Columbus, about uh, his efforts and his organization's efforts and our cooperative efforts as a city to attract conferences and events to the Convention Center. We will hear from Don Brown, Executive Director of the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority, about the proposed expansion. I think there will also be pretty pictures involved. Um, and finally, we will also hear from uh, Director Joe Lombardi, the Finance Director for the City, about the agreement itself. When the City of Columbus commits public resources to projects like this, we need to support living wages for workers and their families. As the first critical component of that, construction workers on this public works project will receive prevailing wages. It's not only those workers who will ensure this project is successful. It will also be, and, and the, the skill that they bring to their construction work, but it will also be the hospitality workers who will keep the completed hotel running each and every day. They will also be part of what makes this project a success. That is why I'm also excited that this legislation will ensure they too make a living wage. They will make at least $15 an hour. I want to thank Don Brown and the Convention Facilities Authority for making this a priority. I want to thank my colleague Rob Dorans for his work prioritizing living wages and workers on this project. I want to thank Council President Shannon Hardin um, and our colleagues on Council. Because of their partnership, this legislation uh, will also contemplate a neutrality agreement for the workers of the hotel, which would uh, prevent any hindering um, of workers to organize themselves. Thank you to my other colleagues on Council um, again for your support. Before we get started with presentations, I just want to pause for a moment um, and acknowledge the leadership of uh, Council President Hardin in this ongoing process, really um, from the time that, that your presidency hit the ground. Um, and so thank you for that. And um, if you or anyone else from Council would like to uh, make any remarks before I turn things over, I want to give a chance for that. All right. Uh, seeing none, I would like to invite Brian Ross to the microphone to talk more about our efforts to attract events to the Convention Center. Uh, Mr. Ross is President and CEO of Experience Columbus. Thank you for your leadership in the community and thank you for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, but uh, good afternoon, uh, President Hardin, uh, Pro Tem Brown, Council members. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the expansion of the uh, Hilton today. Um, the expansion of the current Hilton Convention Hotel from 532 rooms to over 1,000 rooms is vital uh, for us to have the continued growth 
and prosperity of the tra travel economy, which represents 41 million visitors annually, who provide $7 billion in direct visitor spending, support over 78,000 jobs, and generate $48 million in bed tax that supports 30 human service agencies, the Greater Columbus Arts Council, Experience Columbus and the Greater Columbus Sports Commission, and the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority. Uh, it is not with much research in time uh, that we've gotten to this uh, spot as a community and collaboratively. Uh, we can go back to 2012 at an ASAE meeting in Dallas, and we can go also to 2014 at an ASAE meeting in Nashville, um, where we had a panel of leaders with the American Society of Association Executives, the Professional Convention Managers Association, Meeting Professionals International, and the International Association of Exhibits and Events, of which all of these individuals that are industry leaders shared with our community how we can become much more competitive and some of the gaps we have. And to each person, a thousand room convention hotel uh, connected or adjacent to the convention center uh, was a number one priority. In addition to that, uh, we have a, um, a customer advisory council, which are meeting professionals from around the uh, United States. Um, and these individuals plan meetings all over from first tier cities, second tier cities. Uh, and they come in and give us some uh, um, feedback on what we're doing right, where some of our gaps are, and how we can compare to some of the competitive cities we go against. They came in and presented to the Experience Columbus Board uh, on some of the things we needed to do to be more competitive. And again, in 2014, in November, the number one thing that came up was a thousand room hotel connected or adjacent to the community, or I'm sorry, to the convention center. We continued with some of that research. And in January of 2015, uh, we had a group of stakeholders from Columbus uh, get together at the La Meridian and we brought in all the major brands. So you had the Hyatt, the Marriott, Starwood, Starwood HI, or IHG, uh, and Hilton come in with their national salespeople that sell multiple cities throughout the U.S. and quite honestly internationally. And we again said, hey, what are some of the great things Columbus is doing? Where are some of our gaps? You know, other than what that uh, uh, identity challenge is, the convention hotel at a thousand rooms or greater connected or adjacent to was one of the things they talked about. So we took that research and we did a little bit more research uh, through a third party uh, with our competitive set. And some of you have heard me talk about this, but these are some important uh, numbers to understand why this is so important to the community. Columbus ranks fourth out of 11 cities in the exhibit space that we have. We're very fortunate. Uh, just spent over uh, close to $150 million in an expansion and renovation of our convention center. We're fourth out of the 11 competitors. When you look at the convention hotel infrastructure we have, we're 11 out of 11. When you look at the number of hotel rooms within a mile of radius of the convention center, we're 10th out of 11th. We don't need to be fourth out of 11th like the convention center, but we can't be last or next to last in these areas and be competitive. So those are some of the key things we did for research to understand, okay, what's this mean? Then you have new business opportunities. And basically by adding uh, these additional 470 rooms and creating that thousand room plus uh, convention hotel connected to, uh, it'll allow us to grow our target market from 45% to 75%. Okay, our competitive set right now has annual room nights for groups that use 1,000 rooms on peak night to 3,000 rooms on peak night. There's over 580,000 room nights in our competitive set on an annual basis. We get 80,000 of those, that's 14%. We can grow that number with this project and growing our convention hotel offerings. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of impact and jobs into the community. Um, also, it allows us to be more competitive in getting these large groups that book four, five, six years out. Right now, our competitive set books about 45% of their uh, rooms four and five years out. Columbus is at 20%, okay, because we don't have those convention hotel offerings, the number of rooms to offer that far out, which puts us at a competitive disadvantage, okay. Um, 
And obviously, it's so important because we're so proud and excited to be hosting ASAE this year, of which our community, you know, council, the mayor, uh, county commissioners, private, public, civic sector have been so generous in really embracing and helping uh, provide resources. To take full advantage of that, we need this hotel uh, expansion because over 30% of the meetings that are represented in that have 1,000 rooms on peak night or more. So we need to have this and show that we are moving forward as a community to take advantage of that. What I will share is uh, there are obviously some you know, uh, threats if we do not. Uh, we will lose those opportunities that I just spoke about. Um, we will also can increase the over 160,000 room nights we lose uh, over the last three years because of the hotel package we have. So it's important to understand that we have to continue moving forward. I would also say we have to understand that we're not the only ones that are moving forward with the hotel, uh, convention hotel development. You look at our competitive set, and Louisville uh, added the 600-room Omni a year ago. Cleveland added another 600-room uh, Hilton. Nashville has added a 500-room Weston, a 533-room JW Marriott, a 540-room Hyatt. Uh, to their package. Kansas City is in the process of building and under construction a 800-room Lowe's hotel. Indianapolis has just approved an additional 1,400-room I'm sorry, Hilton complex to add to the package that they have. And Charlotte is right now in discussions of adding another 1,000-room hotel. So we also will fall behind if we don't move forward with some of this. So I just want to say that our communities work very hard to position Columbus as an emerging destination in the travel industry. We need this expansion to continue our momentum in becoming a preferred national and international destination. Thank you, Mr. Ross. Other questions? Uh, I have one. Sure. I, I don't know if you can answer this or if it's more supposition, but um, you have a sense as a, a professional in the tourism industry what conventions you target that can really um, that really wouldn't look at Columbus without this thousand room hotel. I'm sure you have your list of twenty, you know, that are kind of top tier for you to go after. Um, is does the logic follow that if we are attracting those larger conventions because of a thousand room hotel, um, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats and then the smaller, the mid-sized or smaller conventions may also, uh, you know, come in more volume and fill out those other hotels around the thousand room hotel and add, you know, additional amounts um, to sort of the economic activity of Columbus. Do you even know whether you can uh, sort of draw that connect those dots. Absolutely, and it is connected. We actually have within our organization different tiers of groups that we're pursuing on a daily basis. We're talking about groups right now that use the convention center, um, and about 25% of all the rooms we book aren't even in the convention center. They use the smaller hotels or freestanding hotels, but a large majority, close to that 75%, does use the convention center. And what does happen is you create, uh, you know, you create the compression where everybody benefits and all boats rise. And that's the challenge, quite honestly, if we don't do something like this. We have a lot of great hotels that are going to be opening. They don't generate new convention business into the community. And if we don't bring additional business into the community with this type of hotel, our current success in business uh, levels are going to um, have the potential to be hurt quite uh, um, uh, quite uh, greatly. Thank you. It's it sort of reminds me of um, uh, you know you you attract a company like like Amazon for example, and then you attract the the, the suppliers um, to uh, to their business model, right? Or Apple right. or something like that. You know that right. the the smaller businesses come in, but in this case, we're talking conventions, events, etc. Right. Um, so. Thank yeah, you. And, and it, but it, it does benefit all those because any type of meeting, trade show, convention, they go from anywhere of 10, 15 rooms on peak night to 25, 30,000 rooms. Thank so you. So there's a large gamut. Council Member Favor? Yes. Do you have a sense of uh, the percentage of projects that we have bid on uh, that we have lost and what that translates into dollars that could have been received through the city? 
Uh, I do not have the dollars on me. I can provide that, but just in the last three years, as I mentioned, close to 160,000 room nights we lost just because of the hotel package. And uh, so that's quite a large amount. So. Yeah, and so what is the pitch to, in, or uh, like the real pitch to uh, ASAE uh, to really get them to, to, to buy into the city of Columbus, knowing that we don't have this addition already um, set to go uh, to, to get folks in? Um. Well, we're very hopeful and, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking forward to this being passed so that okay. we can talk about it. They can see we're hoping to have a groundbreaking for this so that, again, it's not just a discussion. You can see uh, things happening to make this work. Um, so it is, it, it's very important for us to be able to share that this is a project going to happen. Um, again, as I said, close to 30% of these individuals need this type of project uh, to come back here. If they have a great experience but can't fit here, that's mm -hmm. going to uh, be a loss for our community. Um, so yes, we are in, in the, the walkability, the accessibility, um, the overall cost of a convention here, mm -hmm. um, you know, the collaboration, and then really when you look at our, what we're trying to get across is really the brand essence is how smart and open we are, how progressive, inclusive, uh, diverse, that's going to show on its own as well. Thank you. Sure. Did Oh, did we lo lose out on the uh, Democratic National Convention because of the thousand room hotel uh, lack and the Republican, but I guess we weren't really in the final running for that. Was it, we were right up there, you know, almost across the finish line for the DNC. Was, was that why, or can you pinpoint? Uh, I think we all tried to understand exactly why, why we lost the uh, DNC, um, but uh, that was one of the reasons that the overall number of rooms that we didn't have at that point in time um, so it was, uh, and also the type of hotel offerings, um, sometimes we have to look at how we're looking at high-end hotels, so those peninsulas, those four seasons, things of that sort. Um, but again, as we grow this base, and particularly uh, when you start looking at the groups that attend ASAE, these are the groups that usually spend more, stay longer, leave a larger economic uh, uh, spend in, the foot, in our footprint, and that allows us to get more of those groups, which people will pay more, you'll have more high-end hotels coming in, and it's sort of a cycle. Okay, Council President. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, Brian, uh, sure. for, for your leadership and your work. Um, just thinking back to last year when we hosted the uh, Women's Final Four, yep. I'm assuming that this is also a challenge and an opportunity for uh, uh, Ms. Linda Logan and the, the work that she does to make her job just a bit easier in uh, attracting folks, how, how does this work and play in terms of the sports conversation of, of what we're trying to, as we're trying to round up our convention and attraction? Yeah, it, it plays in, uh, it's the same um, conversation with the sports uh, events that we have. And uh, what it allows us to do too is, you, we talk a lot about these large conventions that we wanna bring through the community, which is great, but it also allows us to have two medium-sized groups come in over the same time mm. period too. So when you're looking at the amount of room nights uh, on a given night, it can be one large one or two or three smaller ones. So when you look at that, it's the part of the puzzle that we can do a lot better at putting together and maximizing our community's uh, overall uh, uh, economic benefits. Do you see in the other cities that you mentioned, um, Louisville? Louisville's Louisville? one, yeah. Uh, in those cities that are, are leading these projects, uh, do you see the city heavily in, in involved in, in promoting uh, the expansion in order to garner more um, visitors to that. Do you see it being essential uh, to securing those types of projects? It is important. I can share that uh, quite honestly, our community is the envy of our industry on how well we work together, collaborating with the city, the county, uh, the private sector. Uh, but there is no doubt that the city does uh, advocate for that um, because they've invested quite a bit um, with the infrastructure that they have. I mean, Louisville just ripped down and rebuilt their convention center from scratch. Um, so they've made it quite an investment, so yes. Now, as far as how much um, financial support and what that looks like, I'm not aware of that. 
Um, so. Thank you. Anything else? Councilmember Amy? Hey, Brian. Hey, how are you doing? Um, good. Maybe this is a question for Don Brown, or uh, could be uh, you. I, I noticed the fact that there's a proposed grand ballroom in this property, and I know that um, that's a concern around town is the large you know, meeting space. How does this compare to like Hyatt's ballroom, um, the also uh, the convention center's grand ballroom, what uh, size-wise, the 15,033 square foot it looks like? Do you know, or is that Don? Uh, Don, Don Brown, Brown can definitely okay. answer that question a lot better than I can, but I can say it's, it's comparable. Okay. But it's so important, what I will share, is it's so important to have that uh, minimum number of, uh, I think it's 75,000 square feet to support the 470 rooms that you're putting there so that you can have space for those rooms to meet in without going into the convention center or using other spaces. But the exact numbers, Don Brown would be your, okay. your man. Great, looking forward to that, thank you. Perfect. That is a perfect segue. Thank you, right. Council Member Remy, for that. Um, thank you, Mr. Ross, thank you for, for your, your time. time. Appreciate it. Um, I would now like to invite, right on cue, uh, Don Brown to the microphone to talk more about the uh, hotel expansion proposal. Mr. Brown is the executive director of the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority. Um, you are a, a, a joint creature of the, of the city and the county, and I know that that comes with um, a lot of uh, special, <laughs> special moments, right, to, to, to be this collaborative force. So thank you. Um, for all your, uh, your organization um, is doing to help Brian's efforts um, to promote tourism in Columbus, um, but also specifically in advancing this proposal, really doing so in a thoughtful way um, that pulls county and city partners together um, and has you know, that one kind of North Star um, in front of you. So thank you, and with that, I will give the microphone over. Thank you, Council President Pro Tem. Uh, Council, uh, Pr President Hardin, uh, Councilmember Remy, Faber, and Doran, thank you for your attention this afternoon. Um, yes, the uh, CFA, the Convention Authority, was formed back in the, in the late 80s uh, when the city and county came together. The city, uh, the county appoints uh, six members to the CFA. Uh, the uh, city appoints three members, and the suburban mayors at large point two. So we operate under uh, Ohio State Law on Chapter 351 um, as a public authority political subdivision, uh, but we very much see ourselves as a, a creature, an instrument of uh, city, county, and, and suburban mayor government uh, to basically um, serve as the landlord for convention facilities and also as the developer and, and finally, it's a responsibility to maintain and improve convention facilities. That started out with what we call now call the South Facility, which at the time was called Battelle Commons. Uh, that, that organization went out of business, the Ohio Company, and its responsibilities and assets were assumed by the Convention Authority. We were then charged with developing a new Convention Authority, and that became what is now known as the, the North Facility, the, the Greater Columbus Convention Center. We've expanded it a couple of times. We've re most recently renovated it and uh, expanded it a third time, uh, and that was finished in 2017. Uh, we've uh, added parking facilities. There's one currently, a fifth parking facility currently under construction now. And uh, in 2010, uh, we began construction of a convention hotel, and that was opened in 2012. And it's the uh, we seek to expand that from a 532 room property um, to a, a 1,000 room property, as Mr. Ross, uh, my colleague, uh, explained earlier. Council Member Remy, to answer your question, the, um, the Hyatt, uh, all over the Hyatt, the 45 meeting rooms that serve the Hyatt and the, the ballroom are actually in a convention center owned facility, the South facility. And so they are a tenant, if you will, uh, and, and use that facility. The Hyatt Regency Ballroom is um, about a 20 to 25,000 square foot uh, room. Um, that compares to, we, the convention center's north facility has three ballrooms, uh, sort of like in the, in the spirit of uh, the three bears. We have uh, small, 
medium, and large. Uh, we have a uh, 12,000 square foot ballroom. That's the short north ballroom at the far north end. We have a 25,000 square foot ballroom in the, in the middle. That's the Union Square ballroom in the middle of the center of the facility. And then we have the largest ballroom in the state of Ohio, which is the Grand Ball, the Battelle uh, Grand ballroom. And that's uh, 65,000 square feet on the lower level and an additional 15,000 square feet on the mezzanine level. Uh, in, addition, uh, in addition to that package of ballrooms, and ballrooms are an important, one of the building blocks for attracting conventions to us. Meeting rooms are the second for breakout sessions. Uh, in the North facility, we have 72 meeting breakout rooms. Uh, the Hyatt, as I said, has 40 or 45 in the South facility. Uh, a third ingredient is the amount of exhibit space, exhibition space, trade show floor, uh, <clears throat> uh, op open and adjacent and contiguous trade room floor. We have 373,000 square feet of uh, uh, exhibit floor. So we have parking facilities. I mentioned we're adding a fifth now, which will bring our total inventory up to around 4,600 vehicles. Uh, and the, 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 the final missing ingredient in the infrastructure package needed to compete was the hotel guest room package. And specifically, um, or, uh, national and regional trade shows and conven conventions look for the number of guest rooms within a 10 minute walk radius. And more, uh, more particularly, at guest rooms that are adjacent or connected to the convention center because, uh, they, because of the convenience for the attendees at the conference. Um, there are shows like uh, um, uh, uh, C Cultivate by Amara Hort that will fill 17 or more properties, all 17 downtown properties. There are other shows like the Arnold that we host that will fill 30 to 40 convention ho or to hotels um, across uh, the entire county. So, uh, but the majority of conferences look for ho uh, an inventory of hotel guest rooms within that 10 minute walk radius and ideally adjacent or, con or connected. Um, we are talking about therefore <clears throat> today uh, presenting, uh, asking you to uh, consider an agreement, which is nearly final. Uh, there are four technical issues uh, left to be uh, resolved, uh, and the three parties are working on resolving those. Uh, it's my understanding that a near final version of the uh, agreement has been uh, presented to council members earlier today. Um, the agreement would allow us to, to finance a proposed 28-story hotel to expand the Columbus Hilton downtown that serves as our convention hotel along with the Hyatt uh, so that the, the Hilton Columbus downtown will become a 1,000 room hotel. Now there's some, some things that are special about that uh, which I'll mention in just a minute. Um, when completed, the Hilton Columbus downtown expansion and the, an existing hotel that 1,000 room property will become the largest hotel in the state of Ohio in terms of guest rooms. So that will very much put us on the mark in terms of our ability to compete statewide and regionally with events that are looking for um, uh, to host their conference. We will be the largest single hotel in terms of the guest room property. And as I mentioned earlier, we have the exhibit space package, we have the ballroom package, we have the meeting room package, um, and this will allow us to, uh, to address the hotel, the guest room package within the 10 minute walk radius. There are other items, there are other factors that are considered by groups, such as the amount of airlift in and out the direct flights, but uh, the uh, Joe and the regional airport authority is doing a great job of adding West Coast direct flights and other connections that, that really add to the com 
uh, to our ability to compete in that regard. I think we're up to over uh, close to 40 direct uh, connections at the present time. Um, the cooperative agreement, uh, the supplement to the cooperative agreement, it's titled the first supplement to the cooperative agreement, and it's referring back to the original cooperative agreement that was executed between the city and the county and the CFA in 2010. So that's why this is called a first supplement. It structures the plan of finance for, for the hotel, how to uh, pay for the development of the hotel expansion. And that is now expected to cost 210 to 220 million. That's slightly higher than the estimate that we presented and, and considered and presented to you uh, this time last year for two reasons. Number one, we've had to increase the amount of meeting room space to meet uh, industry standards for a convention hotel. Then we were talking about uh, 56,000 square feet. Now we're talking about a total of 76,000 square feet. Secondly, uh, the construction market in Central Ohio is very, very active and extremely active, and that's caused uh, construction prices to, to grow by 10% or more compounding annually. So both factors are coming into play here. Nonetheless, we, we still are confident that the package will pay for itself. How? In terms of the net operating income of the hotel, as well as the bed taxes generated by that hotel, or more specifically by the expansion of the hotel, and a rebate of the bed taxes uh, the, from both the city uh, and from the CFA. So the, um, the city uh, would otherwise collect uh, approximately five, 50, uh, about 5% of the 10% bed tax, and the CFA would normally collect the other 5% I'm rounding. It's actually 4.6 and 5.4. Uh, but in this case, council, in order to finance the original Hilton Columbus downtown project, agreed to rebate the city's portion for that hotel only to help finance the project. The CFA did likewise, it rebated its share, and we are proposing that the same be done for the expansion. That along with the net operating income of generated from guest stays at the hotel and, <clears throat> and banquet services and so forth, uh, will uh, we are confident based on, um, the, in the opinion of our uh, financial advisors, um, uh, Baker Tilly and Mark Miller is with us today. He serves as our financial advisor, but also uh, by um, Piper Jaffrey, um, the underwriter who's uh, for the project. And Piper Jaffrey has probably financed more convention hotels in North America in the last 10 years than all other firms combined. So they really know this niche this market of financing. But they're convinced and have assured us that um, <clears throat> we can obtain the ratings and can obtain the financing at the interest rates that allow us to, for this, this project to pay for itself just as Hilton 1.0, the, the existing hotel, did. Um, we will be adding 469 guest rooms. We will be adding 54,100 square feet of meeting space. That will include a, a, a 15,400 square foot grand ballroom and a 10,000 square foot junior ballroom. So in addition to the ballrooms that, I, that are in the convention center that I previously mentioned, and in addition to the, Regency, the Hyatt Regency ballroom, we will be adding two more ballrooms within the hotel to serve uh, guests and to supplement or complement the, the, the the inventory of ballrooms that are in the convention center. Uh, the expanded convention hotel will also include a 225 seat signature restaurant at street level on the corner of High Street and Ohio Center Way. Um, it is, um,
window, if you will, window on the world. So uh, it, it, it will be, um, have an entrance that is separate than the guest room and than the uh, guest registration, pick up and drop off and ballet entrance, which will be tucked up to the east on Ohio Center Way. Uh, to, uh, and so it will hopefully, by having a separate entrance on High Street with a High Street presence, it will appeal to residents of the city who may want to uh, dine there or have a drink there or entertain and who may not feel comfortable with going into the hotel itself. Of course, it will serve hotel guests as well. Uh, we will also be adding an 80-seat lobby bar and lounge a grab-and-go, an urban kitchen type of concept uh, for, for those that want to, uh, that don't want to go and eat in the restaurant but want to grab something and go to their room or go to a meeting, a breakout space. And there will be a rooftop lounge with an outdoor terrace with a tremendous skyline uh, view of the city skyline looking south on High Street and uh, looking north from the terrace uh, straight up to short north towards Ohio State University. Under the plan of finance that we're presented, that, that's embodied in this agreement, 56% of the project's costs will be repaid and back solely from and by hotel net operating income and bed taxes. There's no reliance on income taxes. There's no reliance on property taxes. There's no reliance on sales taxes or any other general taxes. It will rely on, in part on a rebate of the bed taxes generated from that hotel itself, as well as the net operating income of the hotel itself. Uh, the other 44% will be also be repaid exclusively from hotel revenues and bed taxes, but that 44% will be supported, the, the credit financing will be supported by a backstop guarantee from the city and county. That will reduce the interest expense, the interest rate and the interest coverage requirements for that portion of the total uh, uh, cap capital financing and it will reduce the risk exposures. So a year ago, we, when we first began discussions with city and county, we proposed a traditional approach, the same approach that we've used for the convention center for the last 30 years which was a 100% financing backed by a 100% guarantee from the city and county. Um, we have tightened that to make it more efficient, to minimize the risk, the dependence that we, uh, our draw, if you will, on the city and county's credit limits, to minimize the city and county's risk exposure. We've, we've done that by maximizing the amount of, of bonded debt that the CFA will issue without guarantees. Now, without the guarantees, the coverage requirements increases from one times revenue to two and a half times revenue. So we have tried to maximize the amount of the project we can finance without the guarantees and and by so doing that, to minimize the amount of credit support that we need from the city and county, and to minimize um, the, the, the risk exposure to the city and county. Um, thus, the bonds will depend significantly less on city and county support than our past issuances have. And seven years of very, of highly successful performance by Hilton 1.0, the existing hotel, demonstrates that the, to, not only to us, but to the rating agencies and to the investor market, that an expanded hotel will be able to support itself uh, with more than half of the bonds, 56% of the bonds, being self-financed without guarantees. This is the first time that CFA bonds will not have 100% guarantees uh, from either and, and, or both of the city and the county. And by the way, we would like to position and uh, strengthen our balance sheet 
working with the oath so that 20 years from now, or 30 years from now, we can finance a future project without any guarantees because we believe that that's part of the charge uh, that, that the city and county have. The part of the expectation is to grow the business, serve, uh, bring in more uh, economic activity, bring in more visitor spending, bring in more visitors to the community without tying up the city and county's credit capacity. Um, two more points and then with your permission, Council President, I'd like to call on Sally Bloomfield, the board chair, to join me for some comments. Uh, we will be, we've had two market analyses done, one uh, separate and apart from each other, one by Hilton uh, worldwide to confirm that the revenue forecasts are sound. We had a separate, an independent, a second study done by JLL, Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, which also arrived at the same conclusion, conclusion that the revenue estimates were sound. But uh, based on the advice from P Piper Jaffrey, our senior underwriter, and, and based on their experience with Standard & Poor Rating Agency, we're going to re uh, engage a third national expert, independent, to give an independent valuation to confirm that the estimates are sound or that they're conservative, uh, but that they certainly aren't too bullish. Uh, we, we want to give you that confidence, we want to give the county that confidence, and we certainly want to be able to demonstrate to the rating agencies that our revenue projections are solid. Uh, finally, as we move forward, we will uh, engage uh, a group of co-managing underwriters. They'll be selected to join P Piper Jaffrey to um, add diversification to the financing team to add local participation to the financing team and to broaden the reach to institutional and retail investors. Our groundbreaking is scheduled for August 11th of this year. That's tied to the ASAE conference. The A it is at the opening of the ASAE conference. We're demonstrating to the ASAE leadership and, the, and that we are prepared to host the estimated half billion dollars of potential conference and trade show business that will, that will follow on the AASAE so that by the time this property opens in 2022, we'll be able to service that additional business. We're projecting a foundation construction will start this summer. We're assuming that a bond closing can be scheduled in September as well, and that vertical construction will be out of the ground and, and you'll see the tower rising vertically. Uh, that will start in November of this year. We're hoping if we, uh, with a minimal number of weather days, that we can keep the construction on schedule and be set to open in early 2022. Uh, may I take your questions, council members? Uh, thank you. Oh, yes, council member Dorns. Yeah, um, Director Brown, just one question. So we've got, you know, a few different parties who are involved with, with this project at this point. Uh, we've talked a lot about the partnership between uh, the city and the county, um, and obviously the convention center. Could you just speak to the relationship that exists between the uh, convention authority and Hilton? Uh, who's the operator of the, the current Hilton uh, 1.0 and, and the 2.0, just as far as how they've been to work with over, you know, over the, the past few years with, with the current facility and sort of moving forward with, with the 2.0 facility? Yes, thank you, Councilmember Dorns. Uh, Hilton, the CFA uh, issued a, com uh, did a competitive procurement that led to the selection of Hilton Worldwide as a management company responsible for marketing, and operating the hotel. They're doing so under a qualified management services agreement with a 15 year term that began in 2010 um, and that would extend through 2025. Um, the uh, management team is led by 
Chris Coffin is the general manager and Julia Hansen as the uh, director of sales. They do a m marvelous job of uh, operating this facility and leading their team. They have a very enthusiastic and engaged workforce team. Uh, we have enjoyed a very um, healthy and very positive relationship with the operator. Um, the, we, um, the operator uh, put together a plan beginning last year to um, boost its competitiveness, to make it able to attract and retain qualified workers to staff the hotel. Uh, it, that program it is called, we call it the best hotels employ the best people. And beginning with that program, uh, we committed ourselves and asked and, the ho and approved the plan by the hotel operator to boost its wage rates for its workforce um, to the $15 rate level uh, by the time the expansion opened. And we're committed to that, and so are they. And I hope I've answered your question. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else from uh, Mr. Brown? You indicated that your your board chair was interested in uh, j joining you at the microphone. For would you like to, Ms. Bloomfield? Please come on up. Yep. Thank you, Council President. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Council people and um, <laughs> President Harden. I, I am just going to cover two brief things, <clears throat> and one of them is on the um, the, the type of uh, personnel that will be involved in the um, in the construction and afterwards uh, employed by the Hilton, and that's because uh, my colleague Rodney French, who was planning to be here, was going to cover this, but a uh, family emergency kept him from coming. So I'm just going to cover the couple points that he uh, that he uh, would have covered otherwise. Uh, first of all, um, I, as my colleague, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a cold today. Uh, as my colleague uh, Brian Ross said, um, conventions, meetings, and tourism, and sports events uh, support nearly 75,000 jobs in Columbus and Franklin County, and that's one in every 12 jobs in Franklin County. That's an impressive number. The Hilton is, is estimated to support 245 permanent direct jo jobs annually and support an additional 150 indirect and induced jobs annually because of this project. The construction of the Hilton expansion is estimated to support 600, or sorry, 400 direct full-time equivalents construction jobs over about a two-year period. And the construction of the expansion is also estimated to support an additional 600 uh, indirect and induced FTE positions. So we want to make sure that uh, you knew the full impact of this, uh, this construction. Um, in addition, I, well, the, other, the second point I want to make was uh, another one that um, my colleague Brian Ross had mentioned a few times, and that was about the, uh, the welcoming of the uh, Association of Executives in August, uh, which for the cities who uh, in the past have hosted this group means that we can expect at least 20% of the events represented at the meetings to book in the Columbus Convention Center in the next five years. The result will be that the number of almost one million convention center guests that we hosted last year will significantly increase in the future. So this is a real uh, economic boon for uh, the Columbus community. And I think um, Mr. Brown covered all the details about the hotel. We're excited about it and we would love to share with you as time moves on the, um, the development of the the architectural plans, they're exciting every time we uh, have a development committee meeting and we'd be happy to share that. I think you're gonna be really excited. We, we believe we have wonderful architects both uh, nationally and locally. And if I can answer any questions. I'm old enough, I've been around since the beginning of the, uh, when the authority was first, 
was first formed, so um, I'm the resident historian. <laughs> Any historical nuggets we want to quiz Ms. Bloomfield on? <laughs> thank you for being oh, here today, and thank you for thank your time. You um, next, we would, um, I'd like to ask Director Joe Lombardi, our Finance Department Director, to give some more background on the proposed agreement itself from the city's perspective. The considerations um, weighed uh, as we negotiate uh -huh. that agreement and, um, and really anything else from the administration or mayor standpoint. Sure. Director Lombardi. Thank you, President Hardin. Finance Chair Brown, members of council, on behalf of the administration, thank you for the opportunity to present this evening and to share with you an update on our community's effort to serve the growing number of large national and international conferences and sporting events that are choosing Columbus as their destination. Just this week, council provided support for the American Society of Association Executive Conference that Columbus will host this summer. This is one of the largest conferences our community has ever seen that will have a $16 million economic impact this year and is estimated to generate $500 million over the next 10 years. However, we will only realize that additional long-term economic impact if we invest in the facilities required to host large-scale events. This has been our focus over the last several months as we have worked collaboratively with the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority, which I will refer to as the CFA this evening, in, the Franklin, in Franklin County to enter into a memorandum of understanding approved by Columbus City Council and the Franklin County Board of Commissioners that outlines our shared commitment to expand the Hilton Columbus downtown. With the support of this council, the Department of Finance and Management under the direction of the mayor and in close co consultation with the city auditor is advancing legislation that details the city's commitment to this project. Through a cooperative agreement, we will establish the expectations, responsibilities, and limitations for all parties and set a clear path for the, pro for the project to proceed and on what terms. The near final draft cooperative agreement before you represents the painstaking work of many, most notably City Auditor Megan Kilgore. Together, the administration has worked with the auditor to first and foremost assure the project gets done but equally as important that this project meets a number of other important objectives, including high quality construction and exceptional facility at the lowest possible cost, to minimize the impact of the project on the city's finances and excellent credit, and to assure our commitment to the project is equal to that provided by Franklin County and no greater than absolutely required to assure the CFA is able to execute the project. The draft agreement before you tonight provides great detail on how we intend to achieve these goals. I will provide a high-level summary in this hearing. There is also a substantial explanation in the draft legislation provided to you and that Council will consider Monday, April 8th. To start, it's important to establish that funding for the hotel expansion will be sole responsibility of the CFA. The CFA will finance the construction of the hotel expansion by issuing hotel expansion bonds. The city and the county will enter into a lease sublease ar arrangement with the CFA, which will improve the marketability of the bonds and reduce financing costs for the CFA. Future debt service payments will be the responsibility of the CFA utilizing revenue generated by the hotel expansion and other pledged revenues. A portion of the bonds issued by the CFA will be secured by the city and county, meaning that the city commits to pay a portion of the annual debt service on the bonds in the event that the CFA does not have sufficient funds in any given year to pay the debt service. The financial backing of the city and the county will be subject to annual appropriations and will only be utilized in the event debt service cannot be paid in full by the CFA. In addition, performance of the existing Hilton Hotel combined with financial projections for the hotel expansion suggests it is highly unlikely that the CFA will be unable to meet its debt service obligations. 
Under no circumstances are the city and the county responsible for the cost of the construction of the hotel expansion. Under the cooperative agreement, the city and the county will pledge the hotel motel excise taxes, also known as the bed tax, generated from the hotel expansion back to the project for payment of debt service. In other words, the bed tax generated by the project will be reinvested in the hotel expansion. It should also be noted that the agreement establishes the expectations that the CFA, the city, and the county will pursue strategies that might allow for debt to be retired early and or reduce the city and county's financial commitment should performance of the hotel expansion exceed projections. The cooperative agreement is formally referred to as the first supplement to the cooperative agreement because of an existing cooperative agreement is in place that outlines the city and county's commitments to the original Hilton Hotel. The legislation before council will allow the administration to amend the original cooperative agreement to incorporate provisions rele relevant to the expansion hotel, but will not substantially change any of the terms of the original cooperative agreement. Finally, as the administration has worked with city council on this issue over the last several months, you have provided very important feedback to us. Most notably, the legislation before you reflects our shared commitment to the creation of, a living, of living wage jobs which help residents support their family, afford stable housing, and access more opportunity. In my position as finance director, living wage jobs are critical to maintaining a healthy city budget, which is increasingly supported by income taxes and which suffer when wages are stagnant. I am pleased to report that language provided by Finance Chair Brown in collaboration with Council Member Rob Dorans has been incorporated into the draft legislation. Your additions to the ordinance will ensure that this project creates family supporting jobs that pay no less than $15 per hour and lay the groundwork between the CFA and Hilton to support efforts to organize hotel workers and share our commitment to support service industry employees. Thank you for your leadership on that. In closing, I want to again thank all those who worked to get this legislation and cooperative agreement in this nearly finalized form and for their continued efforts to provide council the information necessary to make informed decisions and to be confident supporting this project. Council support for this project will be an incredible boost for travel, tourism, and convention business. And while others have already talked about the importance of the hotel expansion, its operations, and the impact on the hospitality sector, I want to underscore the significant overall economic impact to the city and county. Each year, visitors make more than 41 million trips to Columbus for conventions, trade shows, sporting events, or just for fun. This generates $7 billion in direct visitor spending and supports 78,000 jobs. 2018 was a record-breaking year for tourism economy, and the bed tax collections hit an all-time high just shy of $48 million. This is important because increased bed taxes fund some of our city's highest priorities, including social services and affordable housing. Support for this project and the good paying jobs it will create will have an impact far beyond any single convention or event and will help support a growing part of our economy for years to come. It will also help create opportunities for all Columbus residents to benefit and to share in the prosperity that attracts visitors to Columbus in the first place. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the administration and I'm answer any questions that any of the council members may have. Thank you, Director Lombardi. I always have to peer around the podium at you. I don't know if you chose your seat strategically. <laughs> Are there any questions from my colleagues for Director Lombardi, Council President? Thank you, Chair. Uh, just going back to the, the backing the city is uh, giving to the debt service. So say the, uh, we, that, that um, the CFA is unable to meet its uh, debt obligations. How does that like? How does that work? Is there a process? Does it come to this the city first or to the county? Um, I, I remember in conversations a tiered conversation in terms of when 
uh, we, we step up. How, how does that, uh, in layman's term, how does that process work? Sure. Uh, thank you, President Hardin, members of council. Um, as you were indicating, President Hardin, there there are it's called a waterfall. Um, so the the first, I I believe there's five in steps in this particular agreement. Um, the first two or three uh, are strictly the CFA and the hotel tax and, and other funding sources. Should all that not be able to pay for it, then the county and the city would be next in line and it would be equal parts at that point. So they would, we would just pay the equal parts on that point. Uh, Don, if there's uh, something to add, could you please come to the microphone to do it? Sure. Sorry. We can technically hear you, but this is televised and we want those watching with bated breath at home to be able to hear every word. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to add to what Director uh, Lombardi uh, presented and in response to your question, and it's at a point that I should have made earlier and, and overlooked, I apologize. Um, before the, the city or county guarantees would be called upon, uh, and uh, should net operating income be insufficient in any one year, the CFA will be maintaining sizable cash reserves. And so those cash reserves um, have been sized to withstand not only the expected performance of the hotel, but we have tested it against, sh we have with, with several shock scenarios yeah, to see question. how much it could withstand under uh, a, a 911, a catastrophic event condition, and secondly, under a great recession condition. And in fact, we tested, we assumed that over the 30 year life of the bonds, there might be three great recessions. Hope, hope there isn't, um, as well as a shock. And we tested it, and we and we used that to determine the amount, the minimum amount that should be kept in reserve under those conditions. So we're confident that there's there will be adequate cash reserves to buffer the current year income, should current year income have a shortfall, and before we would ever call on uh, the guarantees. Thank you. It's very helpful. Thank you. Other questions for Director Lombardi. Great. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, we have, uh, that concludes sort of the formal uh, um, preset agenda. We have uh, a speaker slip that we would like to um, acknowledge. Is Mr. Mark Fluharty here? Great. Please uh, come to the microphone. Uh, Mr. Fluharty is the Executive Director of the Central Ohio, Ohio Labor Council, AFL-CIO and uh, welcome to council. Thank you, President Hardin, council members. Uh, it's my privilege to be here today to address this important event in our community. Uh, you know, we're talking about jobs, jobs, jobs in our community right now, not only jobs, but good paying jobs. Uh, using uh, city resources in helping our community is good. And also, you know, building our new hotel, new facility with prevailing wage jobs is also good, excellent. Uh, however, those jobs will go away, you know, when the hotel is done. And I'd like to speak, actually, Councilperson Brown, to the neutrality agreement, uh, which I think is very important. Uh, as we're talking about a $15 an hour wage uh, as, as a living wage here today, uh, but that doesn't give a pathway to the middle class, nor does it talk about what benefits are going to be uh, available to workers. Uh, we all know that, you know, when workers have a say in their jobs, uh, they tend to stick around longer, uh, which is also good for our community. And uh, the better job is, the better our tax base is. So I would urge uh, consideration, serious consideration on neutrality. Uh, and I could give another good point to why we should have a union hotel here in town. Uh, there actually will only be one in the state of Ohio here soon because Cincinnati's is closing. 
Uh, that leaves one in Cleveland, and we miss out a lot, a lot of union business that could come here to town uh, that's talked about a lot, actually, uh, and, and attract our union conventions uh, and things like that that we're missing out on as we're talking about the future and, you know, what are we going to do and who's going to fill it. Well, there's a void that's never been touched here, which is union dollars coming to our community, which will only help the situation. So on behalf of the working men and women of organized labor, we are excited about this opportunity. It's good for our community. It's good for our working men and women. Uh, and we're excited to, you know, get to work and build this hotel. Uh, hope to staff it and continue our relationship. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Fluharty, could you explain to people that might be listening what a neutrality agreement would mean? I know it, yes. what it means, but what it is in basic terms. What a, what a neutrality agreement means is that uh, the employer agrees to be neutral and let uh, actually workers make the decision whether they want to unionize without interference from the employer. So there's no negative influence, uh, and both sides usually work out a pre-agreement before that happens of what the rules are. Uh, so workers can actually make up their own minds without interference uh, from, you know, their employer. That's what a neutrality agreement is. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fluharty. Anything else? Um, I thought I had a question, um, but I, I I'm lost it. I'm in no it. hurry. <laughs> um, no, thank you, Mr. Fluharty. I thank appreciate you. your time. Uh, that's a very good point about um, union conventions. Um, any other questions from, from colleagues for any of the speakers? Okay. Um, we will now move along to um, closing remarks. I would like to um, uh, first thank uh, those who came to the hearing today. I'd like to thank um, Brian Ross, Don Brown, and Director Lombardi for being a formal part of the program. Um, and thank you for the efforts that have gone into this. Um, I know that the um, uh, presence from the board of the CFA also indicates that this has been a very engaged process on the part of the CFA um, for quite a while now, and we appreciate your efforts to bring something to us today um, that, I mean, as you explained the shock tests, um, you know, I appreciate the, uh, what you've brought to us today to be as um, sort of cohesive and thoughtful as possible as something for council to consider. Um, so with those thank yous, uh, I would like to give the opportunity for any of my colleagues to offer closing remarks. Council President. Thank you, Chair. Just want to um, add my um, gratitude and appreciation to uh, all those folks who have uh, been working for years now um, on, on this, uh, on the proposal that we will uh, vote on uh, on Monday. Um, to your team under your leadership, to uh, Kelsey and to Chief Brown uh, and to uh, Auditor Kilgore uh, and to the administration who together have uh, kept, I think, this council under your leadership abreast of the different conversations that have happened uh, and uh, even to the last few minutes uh, work to make sure that council's values are articulated in uh, this piece that we will consider. So just want to thank everybody for uh, operating in good faith uh, in a uh, very weedy uh, and technical conversation. And so just thank you. Just wanted to echo those comments from President Hardin. And I really want to thank all the, the partners at the table. Uh, we've just spent a lot of time talking about how do we utilize investment in a local community to help uh, provide living wage jobs that have, uh, you know, benefits, uh, retirement benefits, health care benefits to those who are going to be doing those jobs, and um, that doesn't happen by accident. So I just want to thank again to all the partners who've come to the table uh, with that aspect of this in mind so as we move forward, uh, we can provide those opportunities for folks in our community. So thank you. Um, thank you very much. If uh, there's nothing further from my colleagues, uh, I will remind uh, everyone that this uh, legislation is for consideration likely on Monday, April 8th, and um, we appreciate the time everyone's taken to be here for this public hearing. Um, for those uh, watching at home or in the audience, uh, please continue to contact any of us. 
um, if you have questions in advance of the legislation on Monday. Um, that concludes today's Finance Committee hearing. Have a great evening.